Father, we glorify your name. Let's pray to start this Bible story. I'm so excited. I know, I don't know about you, but next week, at this time, the party is here. The people here, the Spirit of God is here. You know, I'm waiting for this too long, the last time I've been here in the anniversary. And I thank God because he allowed me and my family being here this year. So let's pray. And say, Father, we thank you, Lord, for your mercy, your goodness. Father, we thank you for all the blessing that you are giving us like a family, like a church. Lord, we pray, Father, for this Bible study, oh Lord, that we can learn your word and put in practice in our life. Then we can keep your word in our hearts and, Father, reach another people. Because there is a lot of people who are going to death without Jesus. And we have the gospel of life, oh Lord, that we can learn this night your word and share it with the people who is outside. Father, let us be a light in the midst of the darkness. Oh Lord, and please use our bishop, our teacher this night to teach us and share your word to us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we give you glory and honor. Amen and amen. The theme for the, for the Bible study is the kingdom, for the kingdom, for the gospel, for the kingdom. For the gospel, for the kingdom. It's coming out of Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. Matthew 24, verse 14. Matthew 24, in verse 14, is answering the question in Matthew 24, verse 3. So Matthew 24 and verse 3 is the question to Matthew 24, 14. So maybe they can give me verse 3. Matthew 24, 3 is the question, and this is the answer that Jesus gave along with the long, drawn-out part of the answer. So Matthew 24 and verse 3 says, what does it say? <laughs> And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him, Jesus, privately saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? That's the question. I would like to submit to you that we're in the end times. We're in the last days. We're at the end of the world. And Jesus gives a long answer to that question. Then he comes down to verse number 14 which is a response to that question. And verse 14 says what? Matthew 24, 14. And he said, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. The gospel of the kingdom, that's where our theme is coming from, for the gospel for the kingdom. The idea, the elevation, the consecration, God is doing it that I'll be able to spread the gospel in the kingdom. Some places you have to have certain things or be at certain places to be able to get through certain doors. I don't know all of what that is. God knows the future. I don't know the future. So the Lord now is positioning this church to be a blessing so we can get the gospel out around the world. All right? So everything that we'll be doing next weekend is for the gospel and it's for the kingdom of God. Even though you see robes and you see vestments and you see different things going on, don't be distracted. It is for the gospel and for the kingdom's sake. All right? And you know what? For two years, two and a half years or so, I didn't embrace what was about to happen, but the Spirit of God has dealt with my heart and I embraced this place I embrace the blessing that is coming from the Lord in my life. I embrace all of what will be happening next week because I know that God cannot truly bless you like he wants to unless you embrace what it is he wants to do for you. That's for all of you. If God wants to do something for you and if you resist in it, God can't release the full blessing because you are resisting what he wants to do in your life. That's a law. And I know that too well, so I'm not going to go into next week in my mind and have spoken. I don't want all of those word, negative words against it. I realized that I had resisted. So now I'm putting in the atmosphere, I'm embracing it. Thank God for what he's doing. And I'm saying whatever the God wants for the kingdom, I say amen. Whatever God is doing, 
Amen. You know we're out after souls and it takes certain credentials to reach certain people. I don't know what they all are. God do. I don't know what the future is. God does. And I'm just saying yes to the Lord. It's for the gospel and it's for the kingdom of God. All right. Does that make sense? All right. All right. Here we are. Let's move on. My soul say yes to the will of the Lord. And saints, whatever God is saying for you in your life, say yes to it. Say yes to it. He may be telling you to do something or dealing with you in an area and you haven't given him a yes. And that's what Bishop Mason would made him so powerful. And it became a theme. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. You've got to say yes to the will of God in your life. Yes, I'll be the husband you want me to be. Yes, I'll be the wife. Yes, I'll be the member of the church. I'll be, what? Yes, I'll be whatever. Because some people don't like promotion because it's going to take more of your time in the natural as well as in the spirit. Some people don't want to be promoted on their job because it's going to take more time. and all. So they just rather stay working where they're at. But promotion come from God and you got to say yes. You cannot be saying no in your heart, no in your spirit, and expect God to keep blessing you. Okay? So this is for you. You got to say yes. My soul said yes to God. Now, my goal is to help you win in life. My goal is to help you make it to heaven. My goal is to help you succeed and thrive in the things of God as well as in your personal life. As a pastor, that's my goal. Listen, church, I want you to pray, and I forgot to mention it earlier, pray for Sister Motif, them and their family, their father just passed this afternoon, and um, I told her we have the church praying for her, and uh, even um, the undertaker has not came, they was there still with the body. So let's just pray for Sister Yogi, Sister Motif, and the whole family. They just lost their father uh, this evening right before Bible study. So let's just pray for them. See, it just came to me. I want you to pray for them. And I said, we're going to be here to uh, help you and serve you in any way that we can because they are always serving when something is going on in our church. So let's pray for Sister Mo and Sister Yogi who has lost their father this afternoon, this evening. Okay, so the idea of Open Door is we're here to help all people. I don't care who they are. We all can get better we all can do better and we all can experience God's love and forgiveness in a personal way we all can do better I can do better I can be better I can experience God's forgiveness and God's love in a deeper in a personal way we're here to help everybody. Now, look at Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 6. Hebrews 8 and 6. Hebrews 8 and 6 is Hebrews is telling us that we have a better way built upon a better covenant than the old covenant. Let's read together, class. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator, talking about Jesus, of a better covenant which was established upon a better promise. Brothers and sisters, I don't care who you know and how bad they are, we all can get better. Amen. We all can grow. We all can do better. Amen. And we all can experience God's love and God's forgiveness. Now, Jesus died in order to redeem us from whatever curse we were under whether it's the curse of whatever, different things in our life that's been working against us, different things that the enemy has put in motion against us that we fight against daily. Jesus came to give us the victory over all that. I want to give you a couple of scriptures in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 1. You see, we got to believe that people can do better and get better. And you can't hold people at their weakest position that you find them you can't you can't be a true christian and if you can't see people getting better Amen. the whole idea about jesus and serving god is that he comes to make us better 
If you believe that, then you believe that the worst person that you know in your world can be better. Amen. Why? Because Jesus died that we can be better. Look at what Galatians 3.13 says. Let's read. Grace be to you. Uh, Galatians 3.13. Chapter 3, verse 13. Galatians chapter 3, not chapter 1. Chapter 3. There we are. God bless you. <laughs> Here's what the scripture said. Christ, right, hath did what? Redeemed. That word redeemed means bought us back, purchased brought us back from whatever curse. Christ has redeemed us from what? The curse of the law. Being made a curse for us, Christ took, became what we was that we might become what he is. He became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. You gotta believe that people can get better. You gotta believe that Jesus came to make us better. He came to redeem us from the curse right for it was written cursed is everyone that hangs on the tree so ladies and gentlemen you got to believe i don't care if you knew me when i was selling drugs you can't look at me as a drug dealer even though we in the same church you got to see me as a man of god as a child of god paul had that problem right paul was a terrorist and the church was afraid of him but barnabas said no he's been changed you got to believe that God can change people. Amen. Romans chapter 5, verse number 1 through 11, which is a wonderful text. And the reason I'm saying this is because sometimes as church people, we believe in God's forgiveness for us, but we don't believe in the forgiveness for others. Right? We believe in the grace of God being rubbed on thick for in our lives, but we believe the grace is scarce for someone else. No, we got to know that the grace of God is sufficient for everyone. Everyone. Okay, but is, this is not a license to be honorary and mean and sinful and corrupt. No, this is just saying God gives people a chance to get things right. All right, let's look at the Bible. We're going to read the Bible. And my time is running. Therefore, being justified by faith. Why? Because if you believe the gospel, it brings peace. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a powerful scripture. Verse 2. By whom also we have access by faith. Where? Into this grace wherein we stand. And rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. It is by believing the gospel that people can change, that the blood of Jesus is for everybody, even to the most vile creature, God can save them. Verse 3, it gets better. Not and not only so, but we glory in tribulation also. Knowing that tribulation is doing something, it's working patient in us. Verse 4, and patient is making, working experience in us, and experience is working hope in us. Verse 5, and hope maketh not a shame. Why? Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. How? by the Holy Ghost, which is given, thank God for the love of God. Verse number six. For when we were, look, was without strength, every one of us was without strength. In due time, what happened? Christ died for who? Somebody said that was for me. I was the ungodly. Amen. Verse seven, it gets better. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet, preadventure, for a good man, some would even dare to die. People won't die even for a good person. How many know people going to the uh, 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 electric chair, you know, going to be killed? Because no, I die in their place. You don't know people do that. Family members won't do that. You finna get to put to death because they don't put him to death. Let me die. No, 
that's what the scripture is saying. Even for a righteous man, some would even scarcely die. Verse number eight. But God, somebody said, but God. But God commendeth his love to us in that while we were still doing what we were doing, when we were unholy, when we were still in our filth, when we were still sinning, Christ commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Even though I wasn't all what I should be, Jesus loved me enough to die for me. Amen. So even though people are not what you think they ought to be, Jesus died for them. Verse 9. Much more than being now justified by his blood, just as though I have never sinned, just like I have never committed any sin, the blood of Jesus justifies me. We shall be saved from the wrath through him, Jesus. Verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were brought back to God, that word reconciled means brought back to God by the death of Jesus, his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by Jesus' life. So we don't have time to throw people away. We don't have time to point out other people's sins because Jesus died and had mercy on us when we were not fit to live. Verse number 11. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom we now receive covering. That word atonement means covering or propitiation. He was the substitute that appeased God's wrath toward us. Thank God. And that brings joy when we think about Jesus. That's when we say, when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he has done. That's just talking about a car and some shoes and a house. That's talking about when we were sinners. He died when he was getting high. Jesus died for you. When your family had rejected you and you didn't know what you was going to do, he looked down and made a plan that he would save you one day and bring you into his family. When you didn't know you had any good inside of you, God saw something in you. And he died and his blood come to justify you. This is what gives us joy. So you cannot deny others of the same blessing that God has given you. That's why we're here to help everybody. Now, all of us have scars in our life. And if you're not careful, I was in South Africa and the Lord gave this to me to share with somebody in South Africa. And it was just, you know how the Holy Ghost bring things to you. Sometimes you can go through stuff in your life. It'll scar you. And if you're not careful, that becomes your, your past become your prison. Your past becomes your prison. But it's love is the key that unlock your prison. It's the mercies of God. And if you're not careful, your past will imprison you. Like where you come from, what happened to you, and you can't figure it out, and all this stuff. If you dwell on that, it would put you in prison. When Jesus come to set you free. Everybody has scars. Did you hear what I say? Everybody has scars because the devil don't like any human. He uses them, but he doesn't like you. Whether you're saved or not, he doesn't like human beings. He used human beings for his advantage. And when he get through, he destroy their lives. So everyone got scars. But I've ran across this quote and it blessed me and I'm gonna share it with you because I hope it'll bless you. It says, scars tell a story about our life and it displays the grace of God that's been extended to us. 
the scars displays the grace of God that's been extended to us. Scars tell a story. Have you ever seen anyone with scars or a wound and you say, what happened? And they begin to tell you the story. It's healed, but it's a scar. And being saved, let me help you because you won't hear this on the Word Network and all that stuff. They'll give you a different vision. But the reality is you would be saved and you have scars. You won't have wounds, but the scars show you the grace of God and they tell a story of where God brought you from. That's what scars do. It talks about the grace of God. Even Paul had a, an affliction and he asked God to take it away and he said, no, my grace is sufficient. All of us will have scars and some of these scars you would take to the grave with you. And the scars is to remind you of where you come from what God has did in your life, what the enemy tried to do for you, how God redeemed you. You remember the children of Israel was coming and, and the water was bitter and they put the trees in the water for the bitter water and the Lord says, let them remember the bitter water or the herbs, let them eat the bitter to know where, how bitter it was in Egypt. Sometimes you can get saved and you can forget how the devil tore your life down before you came to God. You can forget it. And next thing you know, you'll be wanting to sneak back to that life that God brought you from. But the scars will let you know how the enemy destroyed your life. And you'll look at the scars and say, oh, they tell a story. The, it's, the grace of God was extended to me. So don't worry about the scars. They tell a story. And everybody has them. Everybody. Everybody don't walk around and talk about them, but everybody got them. And you certainly not going to rise to be a, a leader in God's kingdom and don't have stars. Don't think you're going to do something significant for God and bless people and not have scars. Because you got to tell people about your story. You got to tell them where you came from. You're not going to just rise up unscathed. <laughs> no. The scars tell how the grace of God and what the devil did, what the devil meant for evil, but God meant it for good. Oh, yeah. We all got scars. We, we all got things in our life we wish didn't happen. We all got stories we don't want anybody to know. Things that happen, things that you feel like you lost along the way and how things happen. And one of the worst things... One of the worst things you can experience in this life is betrayal. Whether you're married and your spouse cheat on you and betray you. All betrayal is one of the deep. That's what got Jesus. Judas betrayed him. It's a scar. If it happened to the green tree, did you read that? It's going to happen to the, to the dry. It's going to happen to the green tree. It's going to happen to the dry. The servant is not greater than his Lord. You're not going to go by, and Jesus had to go through the wilderness, and you don't think you got to go through the wilderness. If the children of Israel had a wilderness experience, Jesus had a wilderness experience, don't you think you're going to have one too? So don't act like some strange thing has happened to you when you fall into diverse temptations like, what is this happening? Welcome to the club. Like something strange happening. You're the only one that's happening to. No. The Bible said, don't think it's strange when you fall into divers temptations as though some strange thing has happened to you. It happened to our brethren before us. Okay, okay. This, <laughs> and it's happened to some of us. They just ain't told you. And this is why you have the story you have and the scars you have. But when these people come in out of the blizzard and the rain and the storm, you can tell them what God can do for them. But you sitting up in here and won't tell them. You won't open your mouth. You want people to think you miss Goody Two-Shoe. And you know, you know you wasn't like that always. But you're ashamed of the past because you're not fully delivered. When you get fully delivered, you can talk about it and it don't scare you. 
But when you're not delivered, you ain't talking about nothing you ain't delivered from because you're wrestling still. But when you get delivered and he sets you free and you through with it, you can tell people about it. This is why these young women come in with two or three kids and babies and different and they don't know what to do and they're trying to make sense of life. They've been abused and used. You know what that's like. Put your arms around them and talk to them. Let them know how I made it. It was Jesus. He was the guiding star. Oh yeah, I've been through it. I've been through it. But if God hadn't helped me, I wouldn't be here today. And he, the same God will do the same thing for you. Listen, your testimony gives credence to what the gospel can do. The Bible said you should be witnesses. And to all, and to the whole world, beginning in Jerusalem, going to the uttermost parts of the earth. You are a witness to the gospel of Jesus. Stuff that has killed some folk, you live through it. Some folks lost their mind, but here you are still looking good. Others couldn't handle what you've been through. It was Jesus that brought you through it. Don't take the credit because it's not you. Let me finish, let me finish. Oftentimes we feel like zeros instead of heroes. But I come to tell you you're a hero even if you feel like a zero. You don't walk by your feelings. You don't walk by what you feel. You walk by what you know. We don't serve God by our feelings. We serve God by what we know is true. We know he's worthy, so we lift our hands anyway. We don't wait until we feel like lifting our hands. We serve him because we know it's the right thing to do. We serve him because he said, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with prayer. Not that my world is perfect, but I know he's worthy. So therefore, I give him the praise. I don't wait until the music hit the right note. I don't wait until they sing my song. I praise him because it's another day that the Lord has kept me and I'm so glad. So you have moved out of the infant stage and you're walking into maturity now. You don't serve God because all the bells lined up this week. I come here some days, stuff is every which way. I don't know which way is up, but I know God is good. So therefore, I praise him because he's worthy. You don't interpret and know who God is by your life, what you're going through. You know God, who God is by what you know the words say. Them that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. You're not going to be strong if you know God by your feelings. You know God by the word and by revelation. So even if you feel like a zero, you know you're not a zero. You know God don't save zeros. God don't save trash. Everything God saves is important. God don't have junk in his kingdom. Every one of his children are precious, important. Other people may not see your value, but God sees you. You got to know this within you. There's no way next weekend will be happening if I'm waiting on who gonna look and find out and see that I'm worthy. No, God has to do all that. David was a king. His father didn't see him as a king. His father sent him to look for, for donkeys. The royalty doesn't do that. You send servants to do that. But God allowed it and the prophet Samuel said, God allowed this to happen to get you out here to get a word. You're the next king of Israel. When David got his word, he said, now go home because the lost uh, donkeys or sheep are at home now. But God created that situation so David can get the word that he needed. Sometimes your own family don't see who got your call on your life and who you are. You spending all your life trying to get them to see you as a man or woman of God, forget about it. They'll never see that. It's not for them to see. You have to walk it out among your family. But other folk will see God in your life, but your family will see you when you was walking in your diapers and you fail and you did, they, that's all they know. They gonna hold you to that place. But other folk will see you as God's servant because they don't know all that about your life. That's why when you get so close with folk in the church, you lose respect for them. 
especially if you're ministers and preachers. Yeah, I know they like to barbecue and laugh and grin and be funny. But when people get too familiar with you, they can't see you as a man or woman of God. They don't know how to separate that. And you lose respect. All right, all right. God's grace is greater than all our sin. 1 John 1.30. Oh God, my time is out. 1 John 1.30. You see, the God that I serve is greater than all my sin. His mercy is greater. His love for me is greater. Even when I fall, he loves me so much, he's going to help me to get up again. This has to be within you. Jesus, this simple song we used to sing when we was little. Yes, Jesus loved me. For the Bible tells me so. Listen, red, yellow, black, and white. They are all precious. In his, yes, Jesus loved the little children. That's a profound statement. Amen. This is he of whom I said, 1 John, 1 John, 1 John. That's St. John, 1 John, chapter number one. I think it is it 1 John or St. John? It is St. John. This is of who I said, a man cometh to me preferred before me, for he was before me. God's grace is greater, and that's not the text, but I'm, I'm gonna give it to you where it says he's condemned. If your heart condemn you, God is greater than your heart, all right? There we go. Let me give you that scripture. God is greater. God is greater than your heart. My time is out. I'm looking at the clock. I'm practicing on my time of preaching and teaching. You know, as you get older, you want to be around for a long time. <laughs> and I am, and I am, um, I am um, trying to practice on that. God, okay, so God is greater than our heart. If our heart, First John, what? I can't hear. It sounds like I'm hearing tongues. First John three and twenty. There we go. God bless you. Let me put that in my note, right? Because I talked to a lot of folks. I want to give you that scripture. This is the last scripture. Um, they didn't hear you upstairs. First John three and twenty. Okay. There we go. I want you to read this. You have to meditate on the word. Saints, we can know the word in our mind, but when life happens, it's nowhere around us. We can't find it. We don't hear it. it it's not, it, it, I mean, we know right from wrong, but from somehow all that just leaves us and we are caught up in the moment. That comes, that happens because you haven't been meditating upon the word. You see, when you meditate on the word, it leaves your mind and drops down in your heart, in your spirit. And have you heard people that say this was a premeditated act? It means that the man killed the people and he did it and didn't know he was doing it because he had been thinking about it so many times. Oh, let me, that's, a, that's too, too gross. If somebody you know, we all can relate to this, that you get mad at or they did something to offend you. You keep thinking about what they did that made you mad. You think about it, you keep thinking about it, you keep thinking, all they got to do is one little thing and you ready for them because you've been meditating on how you gonna straighten them out the next time they do that. You already said what you, you done said this to them in the mirror. You done said to them, they said as an imaginary them. You done told them off sitting there in your house. So you ready the next time in the natural that happens. That's what you call premeditated. And before you know it, it, it just happens automatically and takes you over because you've been meditating upon it. Amen. It's the same principle that happens when you meditate on the word. When things happen, the word just comes back to you. It just comes back. The scripture says, if you meditate in his word day and night, Psalms chapter 1, you'll be like a tree. But you can know a lot of Bible here, but it's not in here. And until it get in here, it won't operate. Amen. And when you settle down and cool off, then the scriptures come. 
It should have came before all that. But the reason it didn't come because you haven't been meditating in the word. And sometimes our heart condemns us. And that it, it, what condemnation and shame and guilt does, it paralyzes you so you can't become what God wants you to become. Because guilt, shame, or some past mistake, or some choice you made, some failure you had in God, you didn't ask God to forgive you and he's forgiven you, but you're still beating yourself up. And sometimes we are our worst enemy because we beat ourselves up more than God beat us up. So the scripture said, if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts and knows all things. Don't allow yourself to get beat up over stuff of yesterday when you genuinely go to God and ask him to forgive you. The scripture says in 1 John 1 that if you do it, he's faithful and just to forgive you of all your sin. You can't be a powerful leader and a warrior in, in the kingdom of God if you riddle with guilt. You can't be a successful soldier for God if you riddle with shame because those would be weaknesses that Satan would always use against you to cool you off and to settle you down and to make you not be loud for God because now you're, oh, I can't because I remember, oh, they may find out, they may know. No, when you, the blood of Jesus cleanse you of all sin, I'm not guilty yeah, I went off last week and we had a brawl and I told you my mind. But when God got through dealing with me in prayer and I repented and I called you and got it right and I just cried about how ugly I was, Lord, and I shamed you, the Lord forgave me. Now, I'm not going to walk around and be subservient next week when you see me. You remember when? Yeah, that was then, but this is now. I have grown. Didn't I start off telling you we all can get better? We all can do better? And you're a human being, and you're still growing. So you got to understand that the scriptures are here to help you, not to lock you up. It's to set you free. Amen? So if we're this kind of church, it's the gospel for everybody. We love everybody, and we all can do better. We all can be better. Don't think you you where you need to be because you're not. There's room in it for growth for you. So we come to church to hear the word to learn how can I be better? How can I grow? Lord, how can I get it right? I'm still here. I got another day to get it right. Yesterday I messed up, but today I got to get this thing right. I got to. This is the grace of God. It's given me a chance to correct my wrong. He's given me a chance to prove to him how much I love him. And my actions will prove whether I take advantage of that grace or whether I'm just trying to get by. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, we're in a great time. God wanna use all of us to reach this city and your families in this city, your neighbors are in this city, your loved ones is in this city, and we should be about the gospel and about the kingdom. And we should love everybody, every ethnic group, every background. And even if it's your own ethnic group, but they come from a part of the, they come from the, 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 the low end of life, and you come from the upper crust, you got to know God loves them just like he loved me. You cannot let your status in life be the thing you push when you come to the kingdom. The thing that you push when you come to the kingdom is your relationship with God. Amen. Nobody cares about your materialistic stuff Amen. because that can't help me when I'm dying. Amen. Can't help me to get healed. So don't operate from that. Operate from your love from God and God's love for you. Amen. And, and love people. I'm gonna say the last thing because I was studying about that today. And this, I saw where a man was, he was, he was an entertainer. And, and this other man had dropped out of school, couldn't read, didn't know how to write, was just a poor, used to live on trains. And he became one of the world's greatest success, made millions of dollars. And they asked him how. He said, every time before I go on stage, he says, he confirmed, he said, I love my audience. They come to see me. 
I love them. And how he became multimillionaire and successful. Well, the other colleagues in the same field were saying, oh, look at these poor people out here tonight. They looked out and they really didn't love the people and they didn't succeed. So what am I saying in all of that? I didn't talk about the whole thing, but I gave you the gist of it. You can't be in ministry or serving people or in the work of God because God is in the people business. That's what church is. Church is about people. And you can't be in the kingdom business and you don't like people. You cannot like people. And I, I'm telling you what I know. I've been pastoring for 40, 35 years now, and I've been in church over 40. A lot of church folks don't like people. Amen. They serve God. They have the anointing. They don't want to be bothered with people. You got a lot of getting better and growing to do. Because if you're going to be effective in the kingdom and serving God and his people, you got to love people. And everybody's not going to be like you, act like you, and do things the way you would do it. And you got to be cool with that. I got this last quote. It just came to me. I want to give it to you. I got to give it to you because it fits within this. And you, somebody need it tonight. I'm like the TV preacher. I don't know who I'm preaching to tonight. But somebody need this quote tonight. And listen, it was saying about Jesus. It was saying, God himself does not propose to judge a man until the end of his days. Why should you and I? If God doesn't judge a man to the end of his life, why are you walking around judging people? Oh, that's good, that's good, that's good. You gotta put it in your notes, sleep on it and chew on it tonight. Don't walk around with a chip on your shoulder because you don't know who's who and what God's going to do with them. All you see is the man at this point in life. But that may be the thing that catapult them to their place that God want them to be. Don't kick nobody while they're down. If a man can live, a woman, let them live. If God can bless them and take, put up with them, then you should be able to. God knows how to whip us, spank us, and put us in our place. So if God loves you, I love you too. If God can put up with you, why can't I? God does not judge a man until the end of his life. Then why should me and you walk around and be judging people? I thought that was good. It came back to me before I closed my, God said, somebody need that. If it's not you, somebody online need it. I'm not, and here's what the scripture said. If I had the time, I'd find the scripture. It's Bible, don't doubt me. The scripture said, judge nothing before the time. That's what the scripture said. Don't judge nothing before the time. And we have a tendency as Pentecostals to do that because we feel like we have a monopoly on God because we have the Holy Spirit. No, that's a down payment on what God wants us to have. So ladies and gentlemen, we love you. We praise God for you. Let's stand to our feet.